No, of course not. Okay. Yeah, go ahead and hand it to us. Don't lay on that one. Okay. 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 One more, Charlie. Yes, it is. You need a
Southern California Logistics Rail Authority, Southern California Logistics Airport Authority, successor agency to the Victor Bill Redevelopment Agency, the Victor Bill Joint Power Financing Authority, the Victor Bill Weather District, and the Victor Bill Housing Trust. May we have roll call. Council Member Kennedy? Here. Council Member McEachern? Here. Council Member DeGretti? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Cox? Here. Mayor Garcia? Yeah. At this time, we will have the Pledge of Allegiance that will be led by Carl Chief Jim Nancy. Please state the flag. Put your right hand over your heart. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. Uh, we do have one item on the agenda. Uh, set presentation for community housing programs, including the Neighborhood Administration Program, NSP, and potential Old Town Street Administration. And uh, I guess I will turn this over to you. Or yeah. I'll turn it over to Keith. We'll probably turn it over to Sophie. <laughs> um, I'll okay. have any opening comments. I'll just do a quick preamble, uh, if you will, and, and thank you, Mayor, and members of the council for, for asking for this meeting um, that you know, we have been working on for a few months now. And, and, and really today is in response to some uh, early questions raised uh, uh, about a year ago, maybe even longer than a year ago, with respect to getting updates on our housing programs and, and largely questioning uh, the appropriateness and use. Um, so with that, the latest discussions we've had uh, were last December where we brought to, to this council in this room uh, summaries of uh, a variety of different programs, talks uh, largely about um, things like NSP, um, but then shared ideas with you as to what we can do uh, with those uh, programs. A lot of information that was discussed, so recall from that meeting, um, the council did ask for some time to be able to digest you know, what is taken in at that meeting. Uh, so since that time, we've actually put together a presentation for you that does bring some update as to uh, answering some of the questions that were asked in the last meeting. We are also raising a question for this uh, council as to what it would like to do with monies, uh, particularly uh, NSP monies. Uh, that have been generated uh, now that we've completed the sale of all of the homes uh, acquired under that program. Uh, and then with that, um, one, of the, one of the suggested ideas from the last meeting that's actually been taken a little bit forward <coughs> in this discussion is um, perhaps suggesting the use uh, of the funds that are available in programs such as NSP and leveraging those funds into uh, perhaps a much more strategic, much more targeted approach. So with that, we have uh, the staff write up for you that answers some of those questions uh, that, were, that were asked at the last meeting, uh, and then also brings into um, uh, question uh, ideas we have about moving forward. Uh, so with that, you've got the staff write up, but separate from that, we also have a staff presentation uh, that is different from, from your written material that Sophie Smith, uh, our Director of Economic Development, is prepared to, to give to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. As Keith mentioned, we are going to start off by answering um, a lot of the questions that were raised at the December 1st workshop on housing. We went through and, and, and listened to the workshop again to make sure that each Council Member's concerns um, <coughs> were answered. And we actually put the full information in the staff write-up. Um, I'll just brush through uh, through a PowerPoint presentation for that section, just reminding um, everyone what we discussed in December. Part of our discussion really focused on just trying to understand what is affordable housing because everyone has a lot of different concepts of what it is. But basically, when a low to moderate income family um, pays approximately 30% or less of their annual income on their housing costs, a little bit higher percentage for moderate income households. That's affordable housing. It's, it's the income category of the family and how much the, their monthly cost of either rent or a mortgage is. Um, this slide we had up in December as well, and I think it, it, it really illustrates 
where the households are in terms of their income to be in this low to moderate income category. And as we discovered <coughs> back in December, you know, sometimes the results are, are not what we believe. They're actually much higher. For example, the one that's bolded there is a family of four, four that makes $65,000 a year to be a, a husband, wife, two kids, um, actually falls at 100% of the area's median income. That's, that's what the area's average is. You, they could make up to 78000 and still be considered a moderate income family. And so if that family purchases a home and stays um, 30 per, at 30% or below their income, then they're, they're affordable housing. They're, they're meeting the affordable housing rules. Um, the quote there from HUD that you have not seen before basically shows that you know, families who pay more than 30% of their income for housing are considered cost burdened and may have difficulty affording necessities such as food, clothing, transportation, medical care. An estimated 12 million renter and homeowner households now pay more than 50% of their annual incomes for housing. A family with one full-time worker earning the minimum wage cannot afford the local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. So what that's telling us is that so much of the population is paying like 50%, one half of their annual income on their housing costs. And so the goal of affordable housing is to be able to let those families pay 30% or less so that then they can actually afford the other items, food, clothing, and, and everything else. Um, one of the questions raised at the workshop was really, you know, there was a question of whether or not homes in the 200000 upward of $200,000 sales price can actually be um, purchased and in, in, in under these affordable housing guidelines. And this example here, and we actually put uh, three examples in the staff write-up that showed uh, an example for a very low-income household, a low-income household, and then a moderate-income household. The one I pulled here is a low-income household, and it walks you through all the, the criteria that goes through and how things determine that. At the end of the day, a family of four that maybe has an annual salary of about $53,000 can afford a home that is, with a 3.5% down payment, that's about $199,000. We have a mortgage assistance program that we talked about a lot back in December, and the bullet points on the bottom show that when you couple that with our MAP assistance, maybe there isn't a house available at 199, but that's the financing they're approved for. Um, so maybe they find a house that's 210 or 220, and then they come to the city and they are a perfect um, applicant and perfectly eligible for the city's mortgage assistance program because with that little bit of gap financing, they can get into that 210 or 220 thousand dollar home. The typical, the median sales price here in Victorville just this last month in March was 195,000. So you can find houses in that range, but there's plenty more above that as well. Um, and, and there are some, and usually when they're when they're lower than that, they require, they require repairs. So this is just an example of, of yes, there is affordable housing. Um, that we do at these levels, at these sales prices. The income will, the household will have to qualify and the house will have to qualify, but um, these, are, these are true examples. So it can be done and, and it is be, being done. In fact, most of the NFP properties you sold, as you know, were in this price range and they had to sell to a low to moderate income family at an affordable housing cost. So those criteria have been met. Are there any questions about that? So if you use the term median, median. Yes. The mean is the average, and the median is the middle in yes. the full range, and then there's a mode, and I don't remember what that is. Yeah, one. yeah. You said median, midpoint, but in terms of the quantity of housing, is, is the median also the mean? I mean, is it... It's not necessarily also the mean because, as you know, we might have a, a row of 200 houses of sales prices and yeah. the middle number is... Is the median also where the largest concentration... Right, but, but what it is going to demonstrate is not the exact average or the mean, yeah. but it's going to be where uh, the greater majority are going to fall. 
the most frequent number is the one that's the most frequent number in the set. Okay. Um, another area that I wanted to clear up and add more detail to uh, from our last workshop was about the target areas. We had presented to you at that time three different maps. One showed the CDG areas, and actually those were the ones that were based on the 2000 census, and we have been using them because even though we had a census in 2010, it takes quite a while to roll out um, the new information and actually get them adopted. So starting July 1, we'll be going to the 2010-based census tract. Um, and we also gave you NSP1 and NSP3 maps, and there were just three different ones. What we tried to improve upon and what you have there is one map that shows all of the areas and how they overlap. Um, and there's a large one um, behind Doug here as well that's even blown up even further. I know it's dark. It, if it's not dark, then you can't see the screen. But um, what the two glow-up areas show and focus on is one question that was raised and that was specifically about green trees. And um, what we found as we blew up the map and overlaid them is that although green tree does not um, fall in any of the NSP one or three target areas, there is a portion of green tree, you see the blow up there, there's a portion of green tree that's totally not eligible for any of these CDBG or, or um, low, in, low to moderate income households uh, program, but there is this little area uh, out here on the east side that is. So that's going to help us as we as we uh, implement our program. We can see that especially within 2010 tracks that just came in um, under CDBG that we do have a small area that we can cover um, in the green tree area to help address some of those lighting issues that I think are backing up to the golf course. Okay. Neighborhood Stabilization Program. That's kind of what led, I think, to the workshops back in December. And as Keith mentioned, um, one of the issues that we're faced with as staff is back in 2014, um, council specifically directed staff to put on hold any further acquisitions that we were doing under the NSP program. If you'll recall, in 2009 and then again in 2011, the federal government provided these grant <laughs> funds in their efforts to help address the uh, high foreclosure rates that were um, existing in cities. And the areas picked for the uh, programs were those that had the highest concentrations of foreclosures. So we took to the board and, and got approval to, to accept these grant funds and spend them. And what we did is purchase and then rehab and then resold houses that had been foreclosed. We did about 35 of them. Um, 35. And in, in 2014, I think the concerns that were raised were whether or not this program was um, effective because it's not like we were able to buy up a block at a time. You might have one home in one particular neighborhood, one on the next block, one a couple blocks away, and so kind of this scattered site basis wasn't giving that visual impact that I think we were all hoping um, it would have. And so we were told, you know, finish what you're doing, finish the acquisitions that you're in the middle of, go through the rehab and resell them. And as Keith mentioned, we, we actually um, sold the last one like a week ago. So we're finally done with that phase of spending, and now we have generated about one and a half million dollars of program income that um, we need direction on and, and permission to move forward with um, um, some kind of activity to spend those funds. Just up on the screen are just very generally the, the types of programs and types of uses that NSP can be used for. Um, anything from first time home buyers purchasing a foreclosed home, the ARR, which we did, the acquisition we had resale, land banking, just assembling some properties for um, you know, redevelopment or other future development, um, demolishing blighted structures, clearing buildings, and dealing with some environmental issues, um, and then just general redevelopment acquisition of vacant land and, and really partnering uh, with, a, with a developer to create new housing or new mixed use pro projects, those kinds of things. So while we spent a majority of the funds that we received on the acquisition, rehab, and resale, there are definitely uh, a, a greater, there is definitely a greater range of 
programs and uses available to spend those funds and and, and we have some ideas um, for you. So if we, yes. one of the discussions they've had in Old Town in, in this revitalization effort is um, uh, a perceived need that people have to do repairs, fix up situations on their own own homes. Now, I'm not talking about the rented homes. Mm -hmm. That's a different issue with landlords. But where they own the home and just don't have the money to replace roofs and do that sort of thing. Uh, can any of this be used for that purpose? Does that fit anywhere? Yes. Um, and for fiscal year 16 17, we're proposing um, to use our, our, our annual CDBG allocation for two programs that address just what you're talking about. Um, but but several MSP? Yes. Does that work? Yes, because. Um, the redevelopment category is pretty uh, wow. is pretty broad. Um, in fact, <coughs> not everything that's allowable is listed under here. These are just snapshots. So yes, we can do rehab, um, um, owner occupied rehab, um, quite a few other activities. But and that's exactly what we're trying to do: take those um, those requests and, and listen to what the residents wanted to see down there and partner them with the right funding source and the right program. Can you use the bonds also to redo heating air conditioning? Roof heating air conditioning? Paint up, fix up, paint up, roof heating air conditioning. Where's the limit? Where's the stop? The, the two programs, and then on the next couple of slides, but the two programs that we're proposing to first launch deal with what I'm going to call the cleanup of the Old Town area, which is something we heard loud and clear from the residents down there. And it's more of a curb appeal program, meaning those um, items such as landscaping, uh, deteriorated fencing, uh, maybe painting. garage door, landscaping, painting. painting of the home. Those things that really make your house look um, that, that, that bring curb appeal to your home. The kinds of things you would do if you were going to sell your home, for example. You, you'd have that first impression um, that's what you'd be dealing with. So the program that we're, we are presenting or proposing would be for curb appeal. But the other one is actually uh, called a code, um, code compliance <laughs> program. And what that would do is provide a financing mechanism for low income residents who have code violations. And whether or not that's a, a, a an un, you know, no heat or no water heater or whatever those kind of violations may be, it would provide a low um, interest loan to help them address some of those issues. Not a grant uh, loan. Loan. Yeah, so these are loans that have to be paid back. Right. Madam Mayor, um, and I want to ask about the uh, the time lapse from 2010 census to 2016. Why so long? So the, two, the 2010 preliminary information, if I remember, was released in 12 or 13. The information does not come out quickly uh, and does not flow down I, to the I, program. And I get that. Yeah. I mean, six years? Yeah. We still can't base our information based upon the information that you're telling us. Yes, yes, starting July 1, yes, and the map reflects the 2010 area. That's a federal process. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's federal, it's and, then it is, and then it's rolled out to the state. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's huge. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't How do we make decisions when we can't make them for six years after the information comes out? I, just I would anticipate us using the 2010 information, probably through maybe 2025. Okay. Okay. Well, we won't only start using it until June of this year. Yeah. yeah. We will start using the 2010 because they get the information and release it first like on a, um, they, the, the U.S. Census just basically releases larger portions, you know, uh, like national data. Then they start getting into state and so it takes a long time to get down to blocks within the census tract. And at CDBG we use blocks within the census tract. So we don't even take a whole census tract. We, it's the blocks within them where the data has to be analyzed to figure out if that population is eligible to target these programs too. Oh, 
Okay, and then the only other thing I'd like to add to that is that uh, some of the questions that have come up here this evening deal with replacing, you know, air conditioning, heating, putting potentially solar on homes. Uh, a lot of that is being dealt with at San Bernardino Associated Governments. Mm -hmm. Sandbag has a, a program, Hero, which will allow, you know, homeowners to, to do those type of things. So. Um, I don't know that that's a city function. It is available to to our residents um, as it exists now. So. Yeah, and uh, we're familiar with those, and we could actually provide the, our residents with information on both if we can get that from the county. Um, and it would just be a matter of which financing is best for them. Do they want to put a 20-year loan on their property taxes that might have a higher interest rate, or do they want to put uh, use one of our programs? It, it would just kind of depend, I think, on the individual and what their plans are, the long-term plans in the house, and what the interest rates for both programs are. Okay. You mentioned the curb appeal again. Mm -hmm. The defense, the yard, the landscaping. Is that a grant or a loan? Loan. That's a loan also. Mm -hmm. That's how we're proposing it. Everything that we talk about in the next couple of slides that are programs, you're going to see very brief and general descriptions of what the programs are. We have to go through and thoroughly develop the program guidelines and bring those back to you as council in order to implement those programs. So this is just an introduction, uh, uh, just uh, um, giving you some ideas of what can be done so that you have a lot of, you know what your options are if you want to make some um, changes or develop some programs in Old Town, but they are nowhere at the point where all the final details um, have been vetted because those will need to come before you as a council. I have a question. Uh, so I appreciate all that. Um, so when I hear pot of money, um, when I hear about focusing down on the 7th Street, has a facility or is there a facility readily available for a old town police substation as an example? Or can some of these funds be directed towards that? Because I think that would be a, a big priority and a cornerstone for not just that street, not the street itself, but mm -hmm. the surrounding area. So I'm not sure if that's a, a city-owned facility exists there. Is that they're all private um, on that particular street? But I don't know where that mm -hmm. might be. We actually had one in the transportation center for quite a while. Ultimately, the sheriff's department felt it was better for their offices to be sort of in a neighborhood with the with as UBTs and all the data, whatever they are, the computers that are in the police cars became more readily available. Um, the captain at the time wanted to see his officers say, sitting in a neighborhood that was potentially troubled rather than sitting in an office. So, that's why we went away from it. Um, I think it's something that we can check with Sam to see if there some benefit to having uh, a substation, even if it's just because of the signage that's sitting right there at the transportation center. We used to have a substation on the mall. Is that still there? Um, I think it's a shared substation uh, with the security uh, office at the mall. At this point. Well. If that works, I think it's supposed to be there for a deterrent to shoplifting. Um, and I've been reading, not so much in California, but other cities have been using the neighborhood watch programs. Mm -hmm. And they're also sharing facilities with police departments. It looks bigger, but it's they have changed the rules where they actually, the neighborhood watch wears a uniform that looks very much like a police uniform. I'm not advocating this, I'm just reporting what I'm seeing or hearing. Also, they're having those individuals qualify for concealed weapon permit, and they also carry weapons if they, or if they go and get checked out. Uh, I doubt that California will do that, the famous state that we can sue a ham sandwich. But on the other hand, if it's a deterrent to have officers in an area and we have a transportation center, it looks like it would be worth looking at two things. Having a facility there, even though they're not there all the time, and whether or not neighborhood watches are effective, because I understand, and I wish uh, somebody here at the Sheriff's Department, that they're now recommending that neighborhood watches be activated again. 
I can confirm that they are. Um, we have one in my neighborhood. My wife happens to be the watch captain for our neighborhood watch. Uh, but the sheriff's uh, PIO for our station is actively uh, encouraging uh, folks to get involved. Uh, they can provide the signs, they can provide the training, everything. In fact, I know that the Board of Realtors not terribly long ago had a whole presentation on that topic as well, trying to encourage realtors as people are you know, entering into homes and moving into new neighborhoods that they get them involved with the neighborhood watch if one exists, and if not, that they try to get one started up. Another model I've seen in the research for, for what we can do in Old Town is um, some cities are using um, basically like citizens on, on patrol. Um, I think in Fresno it's called the ambassador program. So they use their citizens on patrol. They have them in an identifiable uniform. I believe they have radios that are connected to the police. But what oh. they serve is as the eyes and ears of the police department. They're walking it around. <coughs> But the reason they're called ambassadors is they're also talking to people and visitors to the area um, and, and pointing them in, in the right direction if they're lost or whatever. So they're, they're, they're greeters, sort of, but they are the citizens on patrol and they're, they are helping to um, staff that, the, the downtown areas. So if you, I, I think you provided the council, um, as well as Keith, uh, with a good executive summary of what we're looking at in Old Town. Um, I, I really like you to jump to some of the solutions okay. um, instead of going over the history because if, if there's a member of this council that doesn't understand the history of Old Town, we shouldn't be here. Um, I think it's important that we try to figure out ways to solve the problems down there and and I think you have some good solutions, and I'd like you to go. Sure. <coughs> okay. So we'll skip the history. The basic point was to show that development pulls away from the downtown area, and that started the deterioration. Um, the reason the slide is in here about why revitalize is sometimes we get the question as redevelopment or economic development, why do anything? Um, and obviously as a city, you know, we're dealing with declining property values, dilapidated housing stock, um, increased crime and blight in deterior and depressed areas like this. Um, and, and as a city, those might want to be some, some issues that we address. Uh, the who will benefit, and this was also in the, in the presentation, but basically the point here is that we need, it, it's not only who will benefit, it's um, who needs to be involved for us to have a successful revitalization program down there. What are the stakeholders, who are the stakeholders that really all need to come together because um, it's not, it can't just be, uh, you know, what the city wants if there's no resident buy-in or no business buy-in. And so, um, the stakeholders, you know, are the, of course the residents and businesses, but also the property owners, the school districts that are that are um, heavily involved down there, the Route 66 Museum, and more recently um, there has been an Old Town Coalition group formed down there. And um, Council Member Kennedy and Mayor Gloria attended in January of uh, a workshop that the group held and they're, they're just newly getting organized and they're being funded through a grant from St. Mary's and um, some of the people from the group are here today. Um, but those are stakeholders were and, and, and that's a group that is trying to get everyone involved. They're getting, they're going door to door and they're trying to get everyone involved who has an interest in reviving Old Town. So with all of these players including the city, um, I think that we have a much better chance of being successful instead of just one group trying to do it on, on its own. Um, just really quickly, I don't know, especially for some council members who haven't been on as long, but there were, um, over the last several years, some efforts to start and kick off the redevelopment of Old Town. There was actually an official redevelopment project area there that was adopted in 98. We did an Old Town Strategic Action Plan to start really looking at the area. The RDA started um, a huge land assembly project 
Um, and when I turn the lights on, I'll show you the map that shows how much land is owned down there, which is going to end up being a big asset for us in the redevelopment and revitalization um, process. We also started and uh, worked economic development staff, planning staff, worked on an Old Town specific plan revision and actually got the document to a pretty much final draft. But because of the downturn in the economy and the way things are going, it's been pretty much on the shelf for some time. Um, and then, of course, in 2011, we lost the redevelopment agency project area, which re results in the loss of a lot of future funding for the area. Uh, but I think now we're at the point where we, we're just saying, okay, in the absence of that, what do we have? What can we move forward with? It can't be the end of everything. Um, the how is just meant to tell you, to, to let the council know it has to be an effort of basically all the city departments, um, all the different city functions. There's the programs we're going to go over, um, and we work closely. I work with Scott um, Planner. Kevin and building, um, Brian and engineering, and all of these uh, city staff and all these departments will have to come together to really do a comprehensive plan in Old Town so that we're not doing um, like a piecemeal project. I, I think I would add as a part of the how and yeah. to try to jump into answering Council Member McEachern's question of, you know, what do we do? One of the things that was highlighted on the previous screen I think is very important to know because is a part of the how that I have certainly considered and asked staff to, to, to consider as it starts developing the program going forward is to take advantage of the assets that are available to this council <coughs> currently. And some of the milestones that we had up on the previous slide actually contained things that, that actually produce something tangible. So for example, one of the things that I think is meaningful as a part of the go forward uh, that's in addition to some of these specific programs that Ms. Uh, Smith is going to highlight is the, uh, the specific plan that was created. We, you know, we've got a very important specific plan. We believe there was a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of energy put into it. Um, and it's sitting there literally on the shelf. It probably needs to be dusted off and, and maybe even updated a little bit and probably appropriately updated to include perhaps what this council decides as a result of this meeting. But I would say that's one valuable asset that's worth taking advantage of and perhaps putting to use. Another valuable asset is resulting from the strategic action plan of 2005 or 2006, whenever it was, one of the things that we were directed to do resulting from that study was we actually went out and acquired an extensive amount of property in Old Town particularly. Um, I want to say the number is in the order of maybe $7 million worth right. of property. And it wasn't just scattered. It, it, we actually acquired properties in targeted areas with the intent of trying to amass large uh, assemblages of property. Because one of the biggest obstacles we did run into when we studied the area was there was too much small property throughout. And unless you wanted, if you wanted to do something meaningful, you had to amass a uh, large enough scale to do something uh, meaningful down there. So I think going forward, one of the things that I would like you to consider as we do go forward is not just looking at these programs incrementally. I think these programs really have to be considered as a large part of what we've already done and take advantage of those assets that you, that you already have, such as the, sp the specific plan, perhaps updating it and finalizing it. Uh, getting that as a, a more viable document, uh, protecting land use goals down there, taking advantage of the property, and perhaps directing some of these specific programs that we're considering now around trying to maximize the use of those properties that we already own. Was, was most of that property we acquired commercial? There's definitely uh, some commercial property. Um, if, if I were to uh, characterize the general nodes uh, of where, um, there's commercial property along 7th and Forest, for example, along, I, I guess that would be the eastern corner. Um, uh, to the north of the old junior high there. Uh, but behind it, when we started acquiring properties there, we acquired a number of properties that extended uh, to the east of that, uh, which were residential. And we actually had some visions at times of with all of that we acquired there because we started acquiring properties on both sides of the street where perhaps we could actually um, eliminate some of the uh, right-of-way down there, some of the roadway systems, to even further make some of those properties bigger. So to answer your question, you've got some commercial down there. You've got some uh, R1 residential down there. There was one property that we acquired that was pretty big in scale that was an old mobile home park, mm -hmm. for example. 
So it's it's a variety, um, and, and through the planning process, we can of course dictate a little bit better exactly how we want it to look. One of the things that's I think also <laughs> worth knowing before we go into some of the detailed programs is we do get interest in that area. In fact, we get approached uh, regularly. In fact, there's a couple of uh, interested parties that contact us on, on a regular basis interested in wanting to do something down there. Something typically involves mixed use of scale, so commercial on the ground floor, maybe high density residential going vertical. Uh, but the challenge you know, that we've run into is the lack of tools, perhaps the lack of direction from the council and, and the lack of you know, clear buy-in as to where we're headed. So I think with some of these individual programs that we're sharing with you, the, the funds that we've talked about, really we'd like to try to get going down a path where we're looking at the funding sources that we have available, all these programs together, using them all together, and one of the recommendations that you do find in there is perhaps even the reconsideration of going through the new creation of a, a, a redevelopment project area, which the state did create uh, last year. A little bit more difficult, but I, I guess one of the challenges that we're running into is, is the need for tools to properly uh, effectuate some, some, kind of, some kind of goals down in that area. Madam Mayor, if I, if I might, and I know you're going to get into this, and forgive me, I was provided with a, a, a good summary, I think the entire council was, and I did the proper thing and provided it to a member of the public, and I, now I don't have it in front of me. Um, but one of the things that Keith alluded, alluded to was uh, the new redevelopment tool that we have, and that's a bill that was passed and signed by the governor do we know what that bill is? Yeah, September, uh, it's 82. It was signed in September of 2015. They okay. created that CRIA community reinvestment like area, community revitalization and investment area. It's like the new RDA. I mean, I, from my perspective, I think we need to look at that. I, need yeah. to, I think we need to know what the community in that area uh, has an interest in mm -hmm. with respect to uh, buying into that particular program, but ultimately, I mean, that's a tool mm -hmm. that he talks about that we can use uh, to help uh, revitalize that area. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's a lot of other things that we can do through zoning and planning, but, you know, that's one of those things that we definitely need to look at. So just really quickly, since you covered most of this, uh, the, one of the takeaways we'd like to have um, council consider from this meeting is um, direction to move forward with that, that Old Town specific plan revision. Um, what we found when we did the studies, market studies with the strategic action plan that was in 2007, is kind of what we already knew. Everybody knows that residential densities are needed to support commercial businesses. And when the consultants took a look at the area, they really, you know, recommended that we look at our zoning and opportunities to increase densities down there. And so the mixed use uh, zoning designation is included in the specific plan revision and that's what we would want to bring in and with that with that in mind increasing densities to help actually support the, the businesses that would locate there. Um, the other things I wanted to tell you just really quickly about the specific plan is it was designed um, and, it to, and it really capitalizes on the whole Route 66 history <laughs> of Old Town because as we were looking at all of our, our, our strengths down there, the fact that we're along the historic Route 66 and yes, we have the museum, and yes, there are signs um, here and there, but really embracing that history, that history that's actually there, and, and, and uh, that is what we incorporated into this specific plan revision, so that's what, what you would see. Um, there's also a portion of the plan that really deals with traffic um, in the area, um, and deals with slowing down and making 7th Street a little more pedestrian friendly again. Uh, things like on um, things like on on street parking um, that I believe we had before and then went away. You know we're recommending in the plan to bring it back. Really, you want to people to walk around and walk from business to business and safely do so. 
So um, those kinds of things are in there. So that's one of the first tools that we believe is necessary to really lay a, a platform for what can happen in Old Town. And then we can uh, delve into the other programs. You know, Sophie, I think that's really what it's emphasizing. Old Town has a culture and a character that is not like Green Tree and it's not like Liberty Village and it's not like Spring Valley Lake. It is very historical uh, and it's got a, it really does. You, all you have to do is be down there a little bit and you, and you sense the, the culture that's there. And, a lot, and one of the things, one of the guys mentioned in that meeting was how people grew up there and then got a little more prosperous and moved out yeah. and kind of and left and moved to higher uh, income neighborhoods, you might say. Mm -hmm. And and there's a certain shame to that, you know. So I, somehow I think we need to look at the strength of that community and build on that, not tear it down and try to rebuild Spring Valley Lake and Old Town. Exactly. Lake. Embrace the, the rich history that's down there. Yeah. Absolutely. The other challenge that we have, Sophie mentioned traffic, the other challenge that we have is there's a significant portion of commuters, 10,000 vehicle trips a day is what sticks in my head, that drive through there every single day and they have no interest in stopping. They're yeah. on their way to work or they're on their way home. Yeah. So part of the plan is to try to reroute them to make Old Town homier and, and less traffic intensive. More of a destination. Right. Yes. That would be the ideal thing to do. Yeah. Um, set up uh, and to so have another traffic all through there. Mm -hmm. And from what I'm hearing, I, I, I believe we have a consensus to actually um, go ahead and um, redo or revise or complete the revision of the Old Town specific plan. So I don't, I don't hear any, any anybody opposing sense. That's the big first. Um, just some other programs or projects or ideas that if, if so desired by the council, we can thoroughly research um, and, and vet and develop and bring back to you and report on whether or not they would work here in our old town because no two old towns are the same. There's plenty of programs that we've found and, and figuring out how it gets to Victorville is what we need to do. But <coughs> throughout in your packet and as well as on the screen, Things like um, um, a different or um, a special development code for the downtown area. We have found many cities that, separate from the um, newer parts of their city, actually have a different development code. And I assume it's because they're taking into account the challenges that you have when you have old buildings, but you have new um, ADA codes and, and so many upgrades that basically leaves a developer with the option of just tearing everything down. And if we want to preserve this as a downtown area, um, I've talked with Kevin Collins, our, the city's bi uh, business official, a couple of times, and um, he says he'll look for whatever we can do still within the within the laws and within the, the building code rules. But you know, maybe it's that we need to designate certain buildings or certain areas historic and, and officially designate them, and then that lets them fall under a different code or perhaps there's alternatives to um, ADA compliance that he can suggest. So it sounds like building the, the building official is really willing to just look and see what we can do that makes it easier to develop down there given the unique circumstances those buildings and those property owners are going to face. Um, along with that program we can look at anything and look at impacts of whether or not diff waivers in that particular area would be something that the council would want to consider with the theory that of course it was developed before and and as it is if anyone comes into one of those buildings and does not ask for footage um, they're not charged a dip fee but the minute they start doing something different than the original footprint then they do get those fees so just looking at programs that encourage development and basically remove barriers to development <coughs> you know we have to we're asking ourselves, okay, if I'm the business or the developer that is moving to this area, what would make me want to move here versus a newer part of the city? What would be a, um, a negative? And so as a city, we can look and see how we can um, mitigate those negatives, if, if we can. Um, things like 
um, using the city's capital improvement program to address some of these um, traffic and, and, and issues along 7th and the other areas. Um, possibly doing sales tax sharing or sales tax rebate programs for those vendors or those businesses that would locate along 7th. Um, acknowledging the investment that they'd be making in, in that particular area um, and promoting infill development because one of the big um, problems that the Old Town Coalition group, group brought up was just all the abandoned, all the vacant lots. Abandoned buildings and vacant lots, vacant lots and how they're making the whole area look. Well, with our own vacant lots that we have, we can promote, partner with developers and, and really get something going on in those vacant lots. Um, and really bring up the look and, and, and the population there. Um, I don't think va vacant lots were the perceived problem that abandoned buildings were. About abandoned buildings were abandoned one too, Abandoned buildings yeah. are the, the bane of that. The board of and everything. Yeah, yeah, they really just don't like the way that the image that that creates down there. Uh, has the city adopted a, an official Route 66 street sign for Route 66 through the city? And are they posted? And maintain. Um, I've seen the uh, historical uh, route designations well, that are brown. But yeah, we've, we've used them. I'm not aware of an, an official policy to use those. I know the county has their own official Route 66 signs that they put up on county roads. Okay. I'm not aware of that. No. Okay. Well, the a big steel banner across Seventh Street down there that says <coughs> Route 66. <laughs> <laughs> Something big. Well, I, I think some, some cities have adopted a sign, I don't know if it's a national standard or it's their own cities, to, to try to advertise as much as possible the original Old Road 66. Yes. Yeah. And of course it's New Street and 7th Street. The second thing, um, I'm assuming with all the property that the city has acquired through different entities at different times, that if someone wanted to build moderate low income multifamily housing and or commercial businesses that we would make those available for the parking requirement, which would be a real incentive to develop. Because when you start developing the parking, that land is just as expensive as the commercial or residential land that you're buying. And since we have so much land available, have we considered making that available to individuals to enhance uh, developers? development of the property. Yeah, and if not, can we? Mm -hmm. In the plan, question. in the draft plan, we we definitely wanted to encourage um, the on-street parking, mm -hmm. but we realized that because cost of the cost of vertical parking structures are usually very high, that because we have so many city-owned vacant lots, that we could strategically place parking areas behind, so you'd have the commercial in front and some parking, but but uh, behind the building. Yeah, and I along think the if, if my memory is serving correctly, I believe the, the specific plan that's on draft actually did contemplate um, locations, uh, general locations as to where would be ideal for public parking, if mm -hmm. you will. So um, I, I guess to answer your question, that can be, you know, certainly a part of the plan. I think it already mm -hmm. is to some extent, but certainly could be. Um, expanded upon. And those kind of public parking spot uh, uh, areas would then encourage foot traffic mm -hmm. and right. encourage right. Right. pedestrian right. activity. Right. Yeah. Right. Wandering. Right. Yeah, when, when the city put in, well, the city obtained a federal grant to widen the roadway to four lanes. Um, that included adding some parking on the side streets, thinking that would encourage foot traffic, and it, it sort of didn't. Um, not sure. Maybe we need to study that more as to why yeah. that didn't work and not repeat that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, Mr. Cox, regarding the signs, I think that's a great idea. Maybe we could think about um, modifying our our own existing street signs along Route 66 to have a Route 66 mention on them rather than just the standard blue. Um, the reason I think of that is because I know the county had invested in Route 66 the sort of logo sign that you see uh, on hats and banners and whatnot um, throughout the county along Route 66 and they had to get away from that and that's why you see it painted you know six feet wide on the roadways is because people 
who are fans of Route 66 in general, uh, were stealing those signs to put up on their garage walls. We have to be a little bit careful about creating a street sign that's so attractive that yeah. it becomes artwork for garages throughout the county. Yeah. Just really quickly, we actually touched on this uh, residential <coughs> curb appeal that we'd like to introduce in 1617 using um, CDBG funds. Um, the one we did not touch on is um, a similar program, but for commercial buildings. So some, being able to provide some kind of low interest loan for small business owners that, um, you know, want to make improvements to their existing facade, um, oh, especially to get if those improvements are in line with what we're putting as far as de design guidelines in the new specific plan, um, but just don't have the money to do that. We were hoping to develop a program like that that will help us um, help them to fund it and become a more uniform and distinct area. Uh, let's see. One of the key, one of the key things, and we touched on it earlier, as far as any of these programs being successful in Old Town, is the perception and the reality of, of improved safety. Um, one of the messages that we heard from the Old Town group down there was, you know, there was a lot of criminal activity and they just don't feel safe. And so we talked today about possibly looking into and seeing if there's a way to either have um, a substation, street patrol, um, sorry, foot patrol, bike patrol, or even use some of these um, uh, citizens on patrol kind of um, programs. So that's going to be really key because the business owners, as well as the residents, as well as the patrons that are coming in that we want to attract to the area, all need to feel safe and feel like they're in a in a, in, a, in a safe environment. Um, the other safety items that we can look at is just using our code enforcement that we have in, and they already um, function in the CDBG target area and that code compliance load program was the one we talked about where if you have lower income families that want to do code improvements that they've been cited for code corrections but they don't have the funding for we want to give them a, a, an option to um, fund those improvements. Um, and then as we start to develop and have successes and get the area cleaned up and a feeling of community and safety, um, we can look at what, what was tried a couple of years back, um, but maybe wasn't so successful, but bring back the, the, the special events and attractions. Route 66 and the museum is a huge attraction and it's a huge draw, but we can also, you know, as we get activities going there, see if there's any city activities that can occur down in, in, a, in a revitalized um, area that will help <coughs> increase that pedestrian traffic and activity. Finally, these are just some of, and we talked about a couple of them already, these are some of the financial resources that we can currently identify that the city may have access to um, or programs. We talked about the CRIA, Community Revitalization and Investment Authority, that's basically the RDA 2.0, that's the new RDA. Um, I think that the reason it's number one is because I do think since it's new and it's um, possibly something just preliminarily looking at the criteria that the Old Town area of Victorville would be eligible for, I think it should be one of our priorities to take a look at that. There is legislation pending right now, it was just introduced in February that um, actually changes the, the criteria to become one of these um, authorities and I think it's because they're trying to make it easier because I don't, I don't believe any communities have been able to take advantage of this yet. So we'll kind of keep an eye on that and see if we can get in on and, and consider that type of financing because then that creates the very long-term financing that you need over, over the years for the area. Um, the fact that Victorville has um, census tracts and areas that fall under that disadvantaged community designation, it comes from SB375 and another one, I think it's 535. But basically, because there's these, um, these campaigns and efforts to create sustainable communities, anytime you're trying to develop something that encourages pedestrian traffic, mass transit, and those kinds of things, which is what we would be doing in Old Town, it seems like it gives you an opportunity to apply for grants and such to, for that kind of funding. Um, 
Another thing we can take a look at is a PBIS. I know um, places, a lot of large downtown areas have one, like uh, Old Town Pasadena, I think downtown Fresno, San Jose, and their, their um, property tax assessments that the property owners agree to that are pulled to just keep the overall look and feel of the main corridor um, uh, presentable. So just something we can look into, see if there's any interest in it, see if it would work. It works other places, not sure if it would work here. Um, and there you have listed your community development black block grant funds to get about a million dollars a year from HUD, um, the neighborhood stabilization program funds that I mentioned. We currently have about a million five in program income. Um, any other grants that we're, we uh, that are aimed towards revitalization of old towns, Route 66 type grants, which are out there, historic preservation grants, we would just continue to filter through and, and look for those. And the last thing that we have is what Keith mentioned, and I just wanted to show you a demonstration so you know the magnitude. Um, it's over, hopefully you can see it bigger here. I didn't have any small ones. But what this represents is all the, it says the HT properties, which is our old redevelopment housing area. But this, everything in yellow, um, just for reference, this is forest. So we're looking north. This is forest. This is seventh. This is D. Everything in yellow is owned by a city entity. So what that tells owned you, by what? A, a, a city entity. Some of them are the Victorville Housing Trust. Some are the City of Victorville. Um, I think some are water, um, the water department, water districts holdings. But what you see there is that we are a large property owner down there as well. And we have a lot of assets as a form of real estate that can really come together with all the private development and really make a difference in some of these areas. So this is this is these are the, the real estate assets that we have that we might be able to do something with. Um, let's see. I think that's pretty much it. Wanted to present all those ideas. I know it's a lot. As I mentioned, each one would come back to you after thorough research and developed into a program, pros and cons, all of funding if necessary. All of those, each one of these would come back to you in the form of an official adoption of a new program. Um, but we just wanted to give you an idea of what can be done if the council directs us to. I think where we are as the overseers of the housing grants and the NSP grants specifically is um, we know that we're in a different environment than when we entered into the ARR program and did all those acquisitions and rehab. But we do need help in, in deciding what we can do on a go-forward basis. Um, and this is one idea and this is one way that you could. I have a question to Mr. Messler. You indicated that fairly often you get an inquiry from an individual about the downtown area for what? Investment? Housing? Commercial? Buying? What's the interest? Development and mostly it seems to be residential, multifamily related. Um, mixed use. Mixed use. They had a mixed use interest. Mm -hmm. Mixed use, meaning commercial down floor uh, or ground floor, uh, vertical residential. Are these, do you believe, serious inquiries that they're really interested in moving ahead? There, there's way to, ways to do it with, with, with the right tools. Mm -hmm. Okay. It seems like the, the uh, one of the barriers to commercial development down there even small scale business commercial development is the is the perception and the view of the surrounding neighborhoods that they just they don't look healthy and prosperous and comfortable and you know and and that then seems to me uh, to fit pretty well with the findings we had from a lot of the residents that help with rehabilitating individual homes uh, could could be really valuable. On the other hand, putting a $10,000 30-year loan on a painting project or a landscaping project to me seems silly. I mean, I, I just, I think there's got to be a mechanism in some cases to do grants and maybe some participation by that homeowner in, in exchange for the grant. They agree to walk a, a neighborhood patrol kind of, thing, you know, Whatever. I mean, all different kinds of things. But but it seems to me if we're going to help on a on small scale, 
projects like that, we shouldn't burden them with loans. I just think that's going to work against what we're trying to accomplish. Can't those loans become grants if they... That, that's what I was just going to mention. Well, we would be presenting to council because these two new programs we hope to roll out for July 1 is if it's an owner-occupied property specifically, um, the goal is to have them continue to live in the home. I, Ten years is just something I'm throwing out, but what you, do, what you don't want to do is have the city money come in in the form of a grant, fix up a home, and then they sell it. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. capitalize on that. And I don't think that that's what the residents want down there. The ones that have, many residents have lived down there forever and they want to stay down there, but they don't have the funds to fix up their home. So if we're able to give them a, um, a loan and have it start to have forgiveness provisions, you know, you stay in five years, you know, half of it goes away or so on and so Continue forth. We can definitely yeah. build in incentives to have them stay, um, uh, like forgiveness provisions, but still protect the city's interest in the form of a loan so that they don't turn around and sell. Yeah. Yeah. We that's would want to accomplish point. both. Yes, so that that's definitely enough. doable. That's and that's good. actually what we've been thinking of presenting to you a couple of different options. That seems to be the most workable mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Keith, I, I just had a quick question. Uh, the specific plan revision, uh, you mentioned dusting it off, getting it in front of the Planning Commission. Would the public have an opportunity to con contribute? Okay, good. I mean, I think that's a great place to start. Sure. Right. Uh, well, I, if you go back to your slide here, which we can't really see anymore, but... Uh, it's on the financial uh, resources. Yeah. Okay. I think number one is, is key, and I'd really like to see the council move in that direction. Two, obviously taking advantage of uh, SB 375 if we can, we should do that. Three ought to be uh, a method of last resort, and the only reason I say that is because I want the property owners in that area to direct that versus the city directing them to that. Uh, if they feel that that's necessary to to bring that into play, then then they should bring it forth uh, to us versus us pushing it on them. But all the other things I think you know come uh, as a result after number two. Um, but I really would like to see the council focus on number one, um, as, especially in light of what we're we're seeing at the state legislature and some of the changes that are going on. So mm -hmm. that, that's really where I'd like to see us focus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Council? No? Can, yeah, can we, is there much we can do to incentivize commercial development on 7th Street? Really, realistically? There is, and, and, and actually with some of these funds, um, I think that the, but unlike the, the redevelopment days where you could actually, there were some real specifics that you could do with yeah. the development money. Yeah. Um, I think the, the incentives are if you waive certain <coughs> fees and therefore you take away a barrier that might help them get going. Um, if we can develop this uh, commercial facade improvement program that could help them fund um, some improvements that they might not otherwise be able to fund. If you're able to, depending on what they're doing, um, if you're able to do a, a, some kind of sales tax rebate program. So I think that there, we do have programs that we can do that are different from the RDA's ways of, of being able to, to fund a uh, development a little bit more directly. But there's definitely, the, there's definitely ways for us to still incentive. One of the biggest incentives is just to remove the barriers that are out there, you know, make it easy, have an easier development code if it's possible, um, have these programs in place, perhaps upgrade the infrastructure for certain key areas so that when a business is coming, they're not going to have to upgrade their water line because I don't know how old they are over there, those kinds of things. That's one of the things that was brought to my attention was that uh, some of the uh, property owners were trying to lease the properties that are vacant, but they have to bring it up to codes and standards, and they don't have the money. Yeah, and that's a big disincentive mm -hmm. to having someone locate there. Yeah. So we have to look at those things, and that's where our development team, our planning team, 
um, will all come together and, and see what can be done, but still meet the city's goals of, of providing, you know, safe and and, and legal. <laughs> well, and I think, Sylvia, I think to that point, what we what we want is if development's going to occur, we want them to bring it up to code. But what we ought to be able to do is through incentivizing them, um, help them pay for the, those costs associated with that, right? So um, whatever the case may be, if they have to sprinkler the building, if they have to put in curb gutter and sidewalks, or, or whatever the case may be, um, and you know, obviously planning, I, I don't see planning here, but... Uh, Stop, right. you're here. Stop, you're Stop, you're there. Okay, sorry, I didn't see Chris. I was looking for Chris. Um, but we need a kind of a, a, a system in place whereby we acknowledge that we are trying to get this done in Old Town and planning and development understands that and they are assisting whoever is wanting to go in there to, to accomplish those goals. So yeah. um, I, I hope that, that we can synergize and bring all those people together. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard from, I can think of two chamber members off the top of my head who are who expressed interest in opening something in Old Town. One was a medical group, the other one was a food establishment. Both of them said, you know, there's some risk involved with doing that, especially this early on in the project, and that if we could come up with some way, it really doesn't matter exactly what way, but some way to help make it pencil better, whether that's a rent rebate or some kind of a break on some cost here or there or, or somewhere, that helps them out for the first year to get established, that they would take a chance uh, and and start you know a small business down there. So one like I said, one was a medical office, <coughs> and the other one was the food I think you and I talked about the doctor who was interested, in, but we, we weren't able to come up with anything that. Well, we, but we can take a look at, at what options may be available. Like I said, it, to them it doesn't money's money. At some point, they just need some kind of a break that incentivizes them to take that chance for a year. And um, they're, they're willing to do it. So, like the, the medical uh, office, um, the concern there was that even though there's no drugs on site, um, unfortunately, when you have the potential for crime, there's just a recurring activity level that requires maintenance uh, as a result until the criminals figure out that there's nothing here of any value. Please stop breaking in. So they've had that happen in other areas. So um, if there's a way to, or you know, through some program to help out, maybe it's not exactly attacking those dollars, but we're giving a, br a break on something else. Um, there, there is interest in trying to help uh, revitalize. Definitely. Help that better educated criminals. We had, <laughs> we had a, we have an accounting office, right? We had a break in years ago. This guy thought we sat in there and counted money, and he was going to break in, <laughs> get all the money we counted. <laughs> uh. um, anything else? If not, we will be moving on to public comment. And we do have some time. cards. The first one that I have is uh, Mr. Felix Diaz. I'm <laughs> 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 no, seriously, uh, first of all, I, I want to apologize to, to the group. Um, I didn't want to come to the meetings, but uh, the older you get, the harder it is for me to walk. So anyway, I'm trying to make as many as I can. But, uh, a couple of you pointed out the, the fact of the uh, security in Old Town, uh, and I believe uh, when we develop the Old Town specific <coughs> plan, one of the things that, that we were really uh, focusing on was the uh, police station, and that was to, to have uh, the, the building there and nothing else to try to keep, you know, vagrants and and criminals uh, away from that area. I don't know how well it worked because it, it, that came about as I was leaving the committee. 
but uh, and then I think one of you mentioned that that uh, had to close it down because of funds. A lot of things happened because of funds. Um, when I was on the, I mean, the, the specific planning committee, uh, we we took two trips, a uh, few trips, one to um, Pasadena, to the local town in Pasadena, and we got some ideas from them. We went to uh, Lancaster and got some ideas from them. And one of you also mentioned that, you know, before we have even housing, I, I, and again, this is my own personal feeling on this, before we can have housing, I think we need to have something that will attract, that will attract people. And uh, the area that is over there with the old, some of you old time may remember the Security Pacific Building, uh, McMahon's Furniture Store, that is now totally vacant. I don't remember who it was, but brought up the idea of possibly doing what Lancaster did, building a community um, performing arts center. That was a pretty good idea at that time, and, and I think we had the money, but uh, things kind of faded away. But that was one, one good idea, and, and, and that, that, that uh, lot is still completely empty. If you if you were to go to Lancaster today on Sierra Boulevard, I believe it is, uh, they have this beautiful performing arts center. And it is expensive. I, I realize that it's expensive. So that would be one way of attracting people. Uh, another another way that that uh, uh, and also the, uh, that empty building is right next to or that empty lot rather is right next to the uh, library. Um, a very a very uh, uh, concerned and uh, surprised that uh, the Victor Valley High School District. Is there anyone here from the Victor Valley High School District that's that's representing Victor Valley High School District or Victor Elementary District? Because they should be here and, and give some ideas. Because uh, the old, which, which used to be the old Victor Valley High School Junior High School, is falling apart, and it will fall apart. Uh, and if it wasn't for the city of Victorville's Park and Recreation, uh, Victor Elementary 6th Street Prep wouldn't even be open today. Uh, that's going to go down. And, and these, these kids that attend, that attend these schools or that would attend these schools, they need security. They need to feel secure. Uh, uh, people that, that have property down there, that was one of the main, the main uh, uh, concerns that people had even back then. I, I don't remember if it was 90. 92, 93, 94, sometime in that in that area, and uh, if, if any of you remember Jeff Goodwill on uh, on Sixth Street, uh, and, and this was told to us. I, I don't know how true it is, but it was told to us that when he was a mayor, he suggested that uh, the building the buildings from uh, Sixth Street down to Seventh on D, uh, that all those buildings be knocked down. Uh, some of them had burnt, the Stewart's Hotel, I believe, or the Smith Hotel, the Pioneer Hotel. Uh, and, and at that time, it was mentioned that, that they were saving the facades of the Pioneer Hotel of all those buildings, just the facades. And they were going to build behind other buildings that would resemble that. And that's when we came up with the old town uh, motif of painting it a certain color and et cetera and so on making it very western or very early California. And that, that went good for a couple of years, like I said, until the money dried up. But there are several ideas that, that we had back then that I don't know if, the, if any money is available, but there's a lot of things that could be done, and I, I believe, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I believe that the, that the county, the city, and the state, maybe even the federal, uh, could, could go in partnership with building buildings, uh, doing something because people are not going to are not going to build houses down there if there's nothing there for them that will attract them. Another idea that we had back then, and that's the reason why we closed down the uh, the parking, was because we had the idea that maybe because uh, there's a lot of empty lots behind. Uh, behind businesses on 7th Street, both sides. And we had the idea that this would make this into a walking 
community like they have in Pasadena, where uh, it, it would be uh, on both sides of the street would have outdoor cafes, coffee shops, uh, restaurants, uh, and, and where people could just, just walk. No cars. The cars could be parked in the back of these buildings. And this would be just a walking facility from facility brother from uh, A Street to C Street. And uh, of course, <laughs> traffic would have to be redirected and Highway 66 would have to make a, you know, would have, would have to make a key tour and so on. So that's a lot of things that, that, that we thought about back then. Um, I, think, I think Old Town, we call it Old Town, uh, has a lot of has a lot of uh, promise, uh, and, and you know I, I I'd like to see that old town come back up uh, one way or the other. Uh, if Victor Valley High School District would, would move their district offices to the old school, and that would attract people, that would attract attention. Um, if uh, the the old town. Well, uh, 7th Street would maybe get the idea of, of building uh, uh, those, those uh, outdoor uh, cafes and things like that for, for walking purposes only and uh, uh, change those empty lots, making it the parking areas. Uh, that's, that's another idea that, uh, that could be developed because I, I I love this job. I love Victorville like you can't believe. And I, and I hate to see it don't believe it. So anyway, thank you for listening. And uh, Thank you very much. We appreciate all that information. Uh, the next one is, how would I pronounce that? Saro Labatani. Labatani. Oh, Father, I'm sorry, forgive me. Ciro <laughs> Libanati, um, actually. Say that again. Ciro Libanati. And I knew that. English will be Cyrus. That's a Spanish pronunciation. Italian name, actually. Libanati is Italian. Like I said, I apologize. I knew your name. No, that's okay. I understand you. Um, I really come here uh, more as a as a pastor of uh, you know, St. John Church. Probably uh, aware that we are there. We've been there for a long time, probably the longest time. And I think it's like a, a good marriage, in good times and in bad times. We've been there. I'm not sure if now it's bad times or good times. <laughs> it is it is the times that that we are living in. Um, I've been and I live there actually. Sometimes in our church. Pastors live to, to uh, choose to live outside of the of the area, and then they, they come and I work. I I, I live there. Um, and actually, I'm going to give an example of, of what I see and uh, in, in downtown, and it happens. And I don't think people realize what sometimes what, what happens, uh, but because I live there. Uh, this last Friday, uh, a lady was dropped out at, at my church by her daughter. Apparently, I don't know the, the, the whole story, but apparently her daughter dropped her off, and basically dropped her off. That's it. You are, uh, I disown her as as my mom, or, um, and then of course she ends up um, um, sleeping in the church because uh, I thought the daughter was going to actually pick her pick her back up. She didn't. Next day, uh, uh, a good parishioner took her in, in, in her home, and on Sunday, which is a very Easter, uh, she was still around. So I said, uh, you know, I want to, I want to have to call the police on, on this one. Uh, you need help. She doesn't qualify as an el uh, elderly because she's 62. Um, so I called the dispatch, and uh, they said, well, let, let us send somebody to check her out and see what we can do. Uh, the police officer that shows up doesn't speak Spanish, uh, although I, I, I suggested that somebody who speaks Spanish come. Uh, and the first thing she, she does is call the paramedics. So I have the fire truck 
Uh, I mean, in the middle of the Easter service, uh, the, the units in, in, in the back don't really need for that. And I mention this because I see a lot of waste of, of, of resources um, uh, just because of fear of liabilities. Okay? Then, uh, of course, she ends up staying there. Not, nothing uh, is, is done. And, uh, and I, I was given a suggestion by the police officer that I told her it's not going to work. She, she told me, yes, it's going to work because it didn't work. Uh, I'm finding myself uh, telling the police officers what, what to do or, or teaching them how, how to do the job better. And I'm not saying this in a condescending way. Hopefully, I don't sound condescending. I'm just uh, telling you um, about, again, the waste of resources. And sometimes, I think, we, we try to fix things with money. And, and money is going to fix a lot, of, a lot of issues here. Because this was an issue probably of, of, of mental illness. Uh, I took her to the uh, emergency um, uh, at the hospital. I was told not to take her to Victor Valley Hospital, which would be the, the choice because it's four blocks away from the church. I says, well, I don't think that they're going to do much for her. The police officer told me, take her to Desert, De Desert Valley. And to make a long story short, I'm there until 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> And uh, and uh, and then the doctor says, well, she's going to be assessed next next day, and, and hopefully uh, something happens. Um, again, I see a lot of lack of communication among uh, the uh, the resources available to people, uh, and I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm with you that the solutions have to come from the community. But sometimes the community, I don't think that they listen. And not to blame anybody, the community sometimes is not well educated. They need to have uh, precise instructions. Um, I have offered my church, you know, for community events, and, and um, uh, I, I'm not sure the presence of the uh, of the people who have some, uh, you know, something to to to, to say. Uh, who are making decisions uh, that they are present in the most helpful way, uh, like, the, like the police, and the maybe city council members. Uh, and I'm glad that, that, that you're here today to address these issues. But um, uh, the, the issue of mental illness, uh, outreach to, to the community, um, inf information given to, to the um, um, people who, who live there, uh, neighbors, um, simple things that can be done that don't need money, because if, if we're going to wait, if, if we're gonna wait six more years, uh, what are we going to do in, during those six, six years? And I, I think a lot of potential to do things to, to, to beautify, even to beautify the place, uh, to involve the churches in in, uh, in helping beautify the place. Uh, nobody has ever approached me and say, do you have a group that could uh, clean? A, a, you know, I, I, I think a lot. Um, it doesn't take a lot of money to do that. I think it takes just a shovel and a broom and then good uh, goodwill and a little bit of a, you know, uh, you know, uh, maybe a trash bag. And, um, uh, so, uh, and, and I want to sound you know, positive, but, but uh, th th again, I think we, we look at solutions and, uh, in terms of, of uh, investing money, and, 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 and then we lose the, the big picture. This lady that was dropped off is a, is a citizen of the United States, not a native, native of the United States, but a citizen of the United States, doesn't speak much English. Um, the bigger picture of homelessness, mental mental illness. Um, I know we are looking into that. If people are listening from the families and from the uh, the people who are suffering in the uh, in the area. Uh, I'm going to be there for four more years, not because of choice, but because of what I you know, I was assigned there for two terms of six years. Uh, you know, I'm willing to help. Again, I've, I've opened the church for many uh, activities. 
you know, AA meetings, NA meetings. Uh, you know, of, of course, you know, we, we host the Lord's Table, which is a, a feeding program for not just the homeless, but anybody who needs a place to, uh, to, uh, to have a meal. Um, so, um, and you're welcome to, to visit our place. We have hospitalities uh, on Sunday. I have invited my own parishioners to to be part of that and hopefully not to come to, to church and pray, which is maybe a, mi a misconception about the Catholic Church. We just don't pray. Hopefully we, we become involved and um, we make a difference in in a neighborhood. We have a lot to learn from that, but um, maybe your presence or challenging the police and all the resources of the city to be more present in a positive way and not just when there's a crisis, that I think would, would make a, a, a big difference, uh, especially because we are there. We are not planning to leave unless, of course, I'm not the boss there, the bishop, my bishop, my bishop is the boss, and maybe uh, somebody knows something that I don't know, but I don't think that the government church is planning to, to leave the, the, the area. So hopefully we can uh, work more together and and, uh, and, uh, and yes, bring back the uh, old town to be a place where uh, beauty shines, you know, shines forth and, and uh, families uh, you know, live good good lives and, and and yes, we have development, but to to me is is about ne healthy neighborhoods, families uh, living well. And, and uh, mean people living meaningful and healthy, healthy lives. So, thank you again. Okay. I think I went over my three minutes, but so thank you very much. I'm sorry. I, I will have to emphasize that I will watch the three-minute time limit. Thank you, uh, Stephanie uh, Asadi. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Stephanie Pizarin. I'm the community organizer with the Global IPS in Old Town Victorville. <coughs> as, many as, as many of you know, we were recently uh, invited and awarded by the St. Mary's Hospital to apply for a community building initiative grant to the St. Joseph's Foundation. The goal of this initiative was to develop res resident-based capacity and implement positive change in Old Town Victorville. In order to achieve this goal, we've now composed a core team of 20 community members that are made up of residents, volunteers, and the business community. During the last six months, we've engaged close to 200 residents through our one-on-one -on -one interviews, uh, resident engagement surveys, and two of our community forums. Key areas of interest that the community has expressed are uh, nuisance behavior and illegal activities of people that are currently experiencing homelessness, uh, crime and drug sales, the use of drugs, as you guys mentioned, abandoned buildings and vacant lots. Uh, given that this information, given this information, it seems like really good timing for the city now to look at uh, the resources that we currently have and leverage some of the programs listed in uh, the presentation given by their staff today so that we can really create a holistic approach to the problems we've seen in Old Town Victorville. I want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity and really opening the door to have this conversation of Old Town Victorville. And I really look forward to the work that we as a community can do. And again, like Father Sierra said, leverage the resources that we have and have the most positive impact for the residents of Old Town Victorville. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Next is Rosie Alveda. Good afternoon, um, council members. My name is Rosie, and I come to you as a long um, life um, resident of Old Town, Victoria. I want to thank you for having this meeting and speaking specifically about Old Town. I came to you during the city strategic action meeting back in January, and I asked that um, you make Old Town, Victoria, a priority or region for the city. For many years, Old Town, Victoria has been a victim of the climate economy. We see problems of vandalism, abandoned buildings, people that are homeless drug um, sales and drug use. Um, we see extreme levels of child um, obesity and high levels of poverty in each of the families. But also we see hope. 
We see power and we see courage. We see the community members, res residents, service providers, and the business community coming together and working towards a change. Um, look around the room here. We have the assistant and the support of St. Mary's Hospital, the Victor Valley Rescue Mission, Father Ciro um, with St. John of Other Church in South Southern Peasant. Um, we have members of the Lord's Table. And we have families that were born here and raised. And then they are now raising their own children here who are stepping up and working towards that change. This community is not looking for a pity uh, party. This community is looking for real solutions and we're willing to work hard for that to achieve them. This is why we want to thank you for tonight and for the opportunity to bring about positive change. And also we invite you to continue to hear what many residents, business owners, and community members have to say about Old Town. And that's why we invite you to the next community forum on Thursday, um, April 21st at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Powers. Well, good evening, council members. It's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, I'm Barbara Powers, and I've been volunteering in Old Town for over five years. Old Town 7th Street from Forest to D currently has 23 activity, active businesses. People don't know that. 23 active businesses. I'm talking about just from Forest to D Street. And this includes three restaurants, and Jennifer's here tonight. She has the uh, large restaurant in Old Town, Caribbean food, and baked buns. The museum on D Street in uh, 2014 hosted 10,000, Route 66 visitors, and it's doubled to 24,000 in 2015. That's Route 66 people. Some are LA, some are, we see them, some are LA, some are locals, some, and uh, there's quite a multitude, but the majority are uh, visitors that are international. They're from all over the world. So the visitors are uh, an important asset to, to Old Town. The uh, sewer construction on C and 7th, as you know, is not completed, which means there's the traffic is now in an unsafe mode, <laughs> going very fast. Uh, every day we see close calls for pedestrians where drivers are speeding to make the next green light. My suggestion on, on where there is no stoplight on A and C crossing is that there be a stop sign put on both those streets. Something's got to be done. Either speed control of some kind or stop signs. Uh, there's there, it's just too unsafe for the crosswalks. Uh, safety is listed in the Planning Commission as their priority. Safety for Victorville. Uh, the Strategic Planning Group has been very thorough. I, I go to their meetings and it's uh, collecting old town data, which will be very beneficial for you guys. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the Old Town Improvement, I understand the Victorville City has been very successful in finding grants of funds. Uh, there are two nonprofits, uh, not including the Lost Commission, <laughs> which yeah, I'm sure they have their own grants going, but these are two, two nonprofits that could use help getting grants. And uh, uh, one is the historic uh, Victorville Route 66 Information Center, the other one is a set free thrift store. They're, they're both on 7th Street. And I'm sure they'd appreciate any kind of grants, a person, or information on how to improve their locations. My question for the council today is, have you, uh, one of them is, did, uh, have you discussed the idea of making Old Town a historic location? And one of the, uh, the fellow that has the factory out at uh, SCLA, he, try to think of his name, he, uh, he suggested that, that we make uh, the Old Town a historic uh, location. The other idea is to include our regional Route 66 board for grant funds. They will match funds on re restoration of the Route 66 buildings. And I don't know what this for. Well, I met we met with Sophie today, which was a real pleasure, and I support her 
forward-thinking old town. I really think it's a very, uh, I hope you all support her and what they're, they're doing because uh, between uh, Stephanie and this group, uh, it's, it's going to be good. So please support them, do whatever you can. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Edwards. Hi guys, Phil Edwards from Valley Rest Mission. Thank you for being here tonight and uh, listening to all of us. We, um, I just, the downtown Victorville area is, I remember it as a kid, right? My dad got in his, wrecked his first Corvette on the corner of 7th and D, a daily press truck hit him. That was it. He had six of them that he wrecked, but too long story. <laughs> so, right? So, my uncles used to throw water balloons on the cars off of the old Edison building, right? I, I have deep roots here, and so it's, it's meaningful to sit in this meeting and listen to the folks talk about it. Um, and I'm very encouraged by the presentation, uh, Keith and Sophie, just thank you. Um, you know, we are a, a organization downtown that is obviously dealing with the problem that has been there for a very long time, uh, the homeless, right? Those who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, maybe those who are just low income and are, are struggling. And so <clears throat> I, I love the plan. I, I love what you guys have presented. Uh, but I would really like to encourage you guys to um, draw more of us into that conversation on how we're going to solve or help solve that problem. You know, I currently have uh, three employees and many more graduates from our, our program that were on the streets of Victorville at one time and now are productive members of society pouring back into those that need help. And so <coughs> literally we've taken them from the front row of 7th Street uh, to a lifestyle of giving back to those that really need it. And so um, it's where, again, I want to encourage you guys to, to help us, you know, allow us to be part of that conversation in, in, in helping them. You know, we as an agency are looking at property and uh, we would love to be in the area where they're at because they're there. They're not going anywhere, right? You can move them like we moved them out of the riverbed, but now many of them are in that downtown area. Many of them are what we call midtown, so they're behind the old, is it the, was it the Levitt's furniture? They're on the, uh, where the entrance to the fairgrounds is. Yeah. Anyway, that yeah. old, old, yeah. And then they're also in the alley. I mean, I drove back there the other day. I counted 25, just, and I'm driving at 10 miles an hour. Right? I mean, they're there. And so with more support from the agencies, from the zero, folks like us, I believe in the revitalization, we can, we can help that problem because they're there. Right? And so that's my encouragement for you guys, just to allow us to be a part of the conversation that uh, would ultimately help this uh, part of the, the planning process and, and be, a, be a part, be a solution. For you guys, you know, we have, as an agency, uh, an organization, I have models in San Fernando Valley, in uh, Ventura County, that are very productive, very do a lot of good for their their communities. I took the Hope Team down there. Hope Team was just couldn't believe what they were looking at. They said, "This is amazing, and you can do this in Victorville." Yes, I have the means to do this in Victorville, and so uh, I would, you know, again, love to be a part of that. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Cliff Maggie. That would be me. <laughs> well, Cliff Maggie, I was born here and grew up here. I've been an educator since 1998. And a few years ago, I uh, was challenged to start a Victorville Facebook page, which is now, uh, so I called it, you know you're from Victorville, and it's stories and photos. There's over 6,000 people that are now members of the page. And I got to thinking, I, I grew up in downtown Victorville. I was employed there as a teenager. My mother uh, managed Montgomery Wards, and we had the first drive-in restaurant on 7th Street, which was Sparky's, and right at the entrance of the fairgrounds. So I had a been working on an idea the last couple of years and doing some research of starting an interactive, exploring, discovering, hands-on, engaging, and learning children's museum. And the, all the 
children's museums and Paso Robles in, in San Luis Obispo in the downtown areas and, and uh, also Pretend City. A lot of the children's museums in researching and talking to them they said one of the things you want to do is incorporate the history of your town and that would be downtown Victorville. And that's like the hub and where it started. And incorporate that in your architecture, into your design of your museum. So I'm proposing uh, anywhere from 40 to 50 different venues where children from six months old to 16 years old would come in. It's hands on, it's interactive, it's engaging. And I would expect conservatively uh, anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 children and families a month coming in, visiting the museum, and I think it could be incredible, uh, just a jump start to Old Town Victorville because after they go to the museum, they're hungry, they want pizza, they want yogurt, they want their Starbucks, and you know, I could see it just developing. I have the support of Robert Loving Goods Office and uh, High Desert Community Foundation, and working again with Stephanie, Back there. And just have a real passion and a vision to see this children's museum go. I'm working on, on finding a venue and place. So I'm also working with the fairgrounds. He said, oh, we'd love to see something at the fairgrounds. And so I'm just trying to find a spot. And I'm getting sponsors to sponsor <coughs> venues. For instance, uh, Midtown uh, or Midway Appliance generously said, hey, if you uh, have a building, we'll put a, a kid-sized kitchen in it with all the everything, the appliances, the counters, the cabinets, and, you know, we'd like to be able to do that. And, you know, you'd have a miniature office for, a, for medical and a dentist office, and there's just all these things that kids can do. I have a whole presentation on it I can send later, but I just wanted to open the dialogue of, yes, I would be interested in, <coughs> I grew up here and I love downtown, I'd like to see it. Uh, just re be restored to uh, what it used to be and, and even better. So that's my passion, that's my heart, and uh, in thinking about Victorville, listening to uh, Stephanie from the Institute for Public Strategies, you know, I, I looked at the identified the problems that they were saying that really blighted the town down there. I said, you know, there's a lot of fear. A lot of people fear going down there. I hear it all the time. I said, then, and my my personal my personal passion is you overcome fear with hope. And if you establish hope once again, people start gravitating toward it. You feel safe again, and that's what we need to do. And uh, if you get four to five thousand kids, I'm working with Rick Piercy and Renee De La Cruz also, and, and they said, if you get that many kids, you're going to have to draw some support from the police. And you have to make the children feel safe and the families feel safe and, and have it a place where they can come and enjoy themselves and, and learn and discover and engage in, in uh, their education. So that's my proposal and I just want to open that door and let's talk some more. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Dominic Molina. My name is um, Dominic Molina, and I am a resident of Otan Victoria. I am here today to speak on behalf of Otan Victoria. I am excited about all the new plans we, that we are expecting for the near future of Otan. I wanted to read something from the, from the city of Victoria, Motor of historic points of interest in Victorville. It says, in 1988, the Victorville City Council established the Historic Community Committee, Committee for the purpose of making recommendations to the City Council to elaborate, declare, preserve, and maintain historical sites and points of interest. Since then, the number of the number of historical sites have been 
identified. All of these places have left their mark on Victorville, even though the buildings and land uses have changed over the years. And landmarks are still significant, they vital, and show distant eras of growth, and most are located in Old Town. Just like all of these historical points of interest, Old Town Victorville show should be recognized for its cloud history and the impact it's made on today's on today's Victorville. Old Town deserves our attention. We need to show Old Town how special it is and we as a community need to come together and make Old Town beautiful again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jennifer uh, Mary. Hello, my name is Jennifer Mack. I own actually two properties in Old Town Victorville. I, I'll say where Fannie was concerned, they were wonderful in helping us open a business. My problem here is I think a lot goes on that you guys aren't aware of. We um, opened a small building and it was next to the Barber College. The Barber College was full of homeless people. So, the lady that follows them, uh, the sign that are, uh, speaking to us directly about how we don't know what's going on down there, makes me think that perhaps we ought to have a group that's more focused on what's going on down there. You know, as a city council, it's very difficult for us to focus on everything that goes on in the city. And so, you know, one of the reasons we have a planning commission, one of the reasons we have a legislative uh, uh, review committee uh, and youth advisory committee, and, and we have public input from those various committees is because we need those folks to provide us with input on what's going on in, in various areas of our city. So, uh, as this plan moves forward and comes back to the council, I would highly suggest that uh, this council consider having an advisory group of some sort uh, that would be related to Old Town and, and its revitalization. Well, they do have their meetings, uh, and uh, Councilman Kennedy and I attended one. Uh, and it's not that I'm not acquainted with the Old Town. I grew up here. <laughs> I was born and raised here. I've been here longer than any of you. Um, but anyhow, um, it was very informative and uh, I was very proud to see that uh, all these issues that were brought up, uh, these people are aware of. Uh, we're aware of most of it, but of course we're not directly involved with it. But um, we do need to get more focused on it. and. Uh, attending these meetings and looking into what we can do uh, to assist them possibly with their ideas and then get some grants and whatever we need to do to help. Quick question. You know, um, come, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, so just for a way ahead, the specific plan revision will be started <coughs> up again. Is that what we're... Yes. Like like that that would be okay, good. Number one. But number two, um, whenever you develop a particular city, there's definitely things you want to do uh, to make everything integrated. Uh, where you put high density housing, where you put uh, commercial businesses, where you put residential, et cetera, et cetera. But has a market feasibility study been done on this particular area at all as part of this? Or there was one done some time ago. Uh, there was one done with the strategic action plan, and there was one done. Kaiser Marston did, did one. In the, in the draft plan. It's been a while, but there was there were studies done to determine feasibility. And the reason is obviously, as a landholder, as the city is a landholder down there, yeah. you can either start with that and sort of program that and phase in this project. I mean, this is a huge project. Yeah. Or, if you're going to wait for the private sector to do it, well, they have their own intentions. And compatible use down there is a big issue when you have right. the garage down there in the corner. You've got gas stations. 
and then you've got various facilities that would be ideal or not, and then zoning, whatever, whatever. But mm -hmm. certainly, I, I believe everybody on this council is very supportive of this idea. We want to uh, make sure that we have the tools necessary with all the different uh, things that are available to the city and move forward. So I'm just looking forward to get going so that we're not stuck. Because we can go around and around. But I just want to make sure that uh, we're focusing on what we have, what tools we do have. Yes, our takeaway is there's definitely some near-term goals that we can accomplish, and that's retooling some of what we have using the, the NSP funds. Um, that's something that's got to be handled right away. But I think our goal for having this discussion was not wanting to retool something like an NSP uh, fund and spending it in Old Town when there isn't a larger plan in place. So there's some near-term goals we're going to roll into, dusting off the specific plan, um, and then also looking at exploring probably some of the longer term goals, which is the <coughs> redevelopment 2.0 type okay. thing. But we'll, we'll make it a little bit more concise so that you can kind of see the game plan and as we bring the respective individual programs forward that fall into the larger, uh, we'll also be bringing those back to, to council for approval. A couple of things. One of the things Father said is that every problem is down there is necessarily going to be solved with money. I'd, I'd like to find the money that's available that we can commit and use it wisely, but I think we also have to be open to all the other possibilities that may not involve spending money. The other thing that I've heard from a couple of people is we have to resist the temptation of sitting in City Hall and deciding what's best for Old Town. I think we have to be involved with the people who live and work there uh, and understand how they see their issues. I, and I think we need to be more present. I'm not, I'm not sure an advisory group is what we need. I think we all, if we all spend as much time in Old Town as we spend out on Restaurant Row, uh, you know, we'd probably have a lot better connection. Uh, I think there are some things we need to think about. One of the other things I know is really needed is uh, a cleanup of the area. I mean, there's vacant lots with sofas, mattresses, I mean, you know, just all kinds of stuff all over the place. Jim and I did a complete tour of every single street. Uh, we actually inventoried everything that we saw, you know, so that we would know. I was surprised to see how much there is out there that needs to be cleaned up. Uh, you get so hung up on just traveling certain streets or roads and you don't see the others, you know. But we made it a point to spend uh, a half a day just going around and looking and we know that we need to do something and we need to do it immediately. I mean, it's not something that can wait three, four years from now. It needs to be done now. Sure. So we do have a community cleanup coming up in about a week and a half if there's any groups out there that are interested in participating in that. There will be, uh, you know, free dump services available. Um, you can select, you know, the lot or the series of lots of your choice. Um, just give just everyone's steps gone for the night. <coughs> give a call in the morning to City Hall and let them know that you're interested in the community cleanup day. I believe it's on Saturday, the 9th. April 9th. Yeah. yeah, April 9th. Thank you, uh, Sue. Um, so there's still time to, to get involved with that as well as well as letting us know where there are issues that need to be taken care of that we might not know about, but you know about, let us know. Uh, I believe I gave the information to Dana regarding Jennifer. I don't know if she made contact with her um, regarding, you know, scheduling cleanups. Right, right. Uh, so I put them in contact with one another. I okay, thought it good. would be better than me trying to relay all this information. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So. I'd also like to ask that we address the lady's concern, the restaurant owner who, who expressed some real dissatisfaction with code enforcement. Let's, there are always two sides to every story. We all know that. But I think every story needs to be heard. And we need yeah. to. Uh, our, yeah. our code enforcement official is here tonight. I know he, he heard. And I, don't even have to tell him. I'm quite confident that he'll be researching that uh, starting tomorrow. We take great pride in our code enforcement group, mm -hmm. and uh, we don't like to hear criticism. Mm -hmm. We'll listen to it, though. We want to hear it. Yeah. We don't like to hear it, but we want to hear it. Yeah, we've actually implemented through the planning department uh, 
some changes to help with small businesses when they come to the counter that has probably occurred after this business opened. Um, so we're hearing loud and clear that uh, we're on the right track with that. Okay. okay. Anything else? Well, thank you, everyone. I believe this was very productive, and uh, we will continue having our meetings, and we will make it a point to attend. I believe I am going to be out of town on the next one, which is on the 17th, no, what is it, uh, the 18th? 21st. 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 I have flyers. Oh. If anybody would like a flyer. Please okay. leave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I may be out of town or coming back. I think we can. Uh, we should be back. Early Midnight. morning on the 21st. Yeah. That's okay. We'll take a nap. We're going to be on the East Coast on the 21st, so oh, I can, there's no way. Yeah. Yeah. This meeting is good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we I have